My name is uh, Bill Dwight. I'm City Council President for the City of Northampton. Um, allow me to set up what we're going to be discussing this evening. First of all, I should note this is the first of perhaps several meetings. Um, this is essentially we have a number of critical choices that are facing us at a critical time. Um, a critical time in our history, a critical time in the economy, and and particularly challenging for people who live in this community. Um, we have present tonight uh, members of the Board of Public Works uh, Conference Committee, which includes three city councilors, who I'll have to introduce himself in a moment. And then we also have conference committee members from the Board of Public Works, and they'll introduce themselves as well. We also, but we also have um, present tonight uh, the, uh, the director of the Department of Public Works, and we'll we're going to do, the hope is at first, is introduce almost an order of priority and urgency uh, the issues that we're going to be facing us relative to the infrastructure of this city, the, the, the critical core, the part. Now, I, I'm just going to deviate a little bit from here because I've often said the thing about the Department of Public Works is they don't get the glory that the fire department gets when they show up and put out your house and it's on fire. Everyone's very grateful to see that happen. And the same thing with the police when they show up with a blue light. When the orange light shows up, it shows up because there's a pothole, storm drains, <laughs> messed up. There's, there's no glory associated with it, yet it is arguably the most critical dimension of the city. It's what keeps us moving, going, and actually keeps <coughs> us safe. And sometimes it gets short shrift, or sometimes it functions below the radar, below people's attention. Well, uh, Councilor Specter and Adams and Tacey were actually particularly concerned <coughs> about the fact that there was a disconnect between the public's sense of what it is the Board of Public Works represents and what the Board of Public Works does. Mind you, there's money involved. And the fact is, we're the politic side. We're the people who get elected. We're the ones who make empty promises and, and glad hand quotes. Uh, so it's our job actually, our job literally as counselors is to serve as liaisons and explain. Or uh, And first we have to understand before we can explain. I think that's kind of an important element. The Department of Public Works are principally engineers. That's what we hired them to do. So their, their job isn't necessarily, that isn't first in their mind when they're dealing with these issues. So. This is the start, hopefully, of not only, this is a cultural start, our hope is, that this will actually represent the way we conduct polity and business in the city of Northampton from this point on. So um, I'm going to ask, uh, well, at least the guys up here next to a mic first will introduce themselves so that they can, uh, so you all know who they are, because you voted for them. Paul Spector, Ward 2 City Council. I just want to add a little bit to what Bill said. I, and I quote out of tonight's meeting, and this is only the one of a number of, of public meetings that we're going to have, that people can leave here tonight. We all understand the, the scope of what we're facing in terms of our infrastructure. Um, I know when I first uh, heard about this myself, it was like, it, it was staggering what we're being asked to do and some of the mandates the federal government is saying we're, we need to do. And I hope that people out of tonight's meeting just understand we're all in, in this together. We're all trying to find solutions to these problems. Um, we don't have all the answers yet, and I think that's what this discussion is about, is just make sure we all understand how big, how much money especially we're going to be looking at over the next 10 or 20 years to address some of these issues. I'm Gene Casey, Board of Seven, um, and I'm also on the conference committee. And this is an attempt at uh, uh, getting some public input. Uh, you, the more public input you have, the more legitimacy that you that you create. So that's what this is all about. It's informational. Uh, we don't even, we don't exactly know at this point where this is going from here. We just know that uh, something somewhere along the line. Nobody knew about 
about this before it happened. Actually, it was in the papers, but advertised pretty well. And I expected that there might be more people here than there are. I can't hear you. Can't hear it. I, I have nothing to add to what, what the other counselors said. Um, I want to thank you all for being here and get started. And we shall get started. Uh, and just to let you know that actually the, the, the way this process works tonight is we're going to have um, Terry Culhane, who's the uh, chair of the Board of Public Works, who will introduce, I think you, uh, Terry hopefully will give a kind of a broad brush. Right. Uh, sketch. Ned will fill in the details. Ned Huntley is the director of uh, uh, the Department of Public Works. The critical point here is that decisions are not made. There are people clearly trying to figure out and strategize at this point. But the fact is, is that yeah, we might have had more people here. But the, I, you know, I listen. I'm not fooling myself into thinking this is the thing that a lot of people are going to give up their nights for. You say, oh yes, we're going to talk about capital projects. Or, or the expenses and the, and, the, and, the, and the daunting things that are facing us in the future, you know, given some other choices, people might choose, you know, Applebee's. But in the process of this, we are empowering, hopefully empowering you to also participate in this conversation, also to share the conversation with friends and neighbors and I think with greater understanding about what faces us, we have to face this together. We do, and let me be clear, I'm not going to sugarcoat this, we have significant uh, challenges facing us. Significant ones. And you're about to get a sense of how significant they are in just a moment. So um, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Terry Colhan. And Terry, you know what, why don't you come up and sit down so you're more comfortable. I'll just get out of the way here. Uh, good evening. Thank you for coming. As you've heard, I'm Terry Culhane, the chair of the Board of Public Works. In, in the discussion, Bill mentioned a broader range of infrastructure here in the city. The specific reason we're here tonight, though, revolves around stormwater. Stormwater is basically rainwater or snowmelt. Uh, from a public works perspective, a, a big thunderstorm or even worse, a hurricane can dump an astonishing amount of water on the city in a fairly brief period of time. And this can have a major impact on the city's infrastructure. Uh, similarly, a spring thaw up in Vermont or even closer to home can quickly melt enough snow in the spring that suddenly our rivers are going over their banks. So the stormwater can affect our city in two different ways. Runoff water, high volumes of runoff water, and flood, river flood. And we protect the city with two separate but complementary systems. There's a levee system that was built by the federal government about 70 years ago, which is designed to prevent the rivers from flooding into the lower sections of Northampton. That would be Conn Street, uh, Pleasant Street, William Street, the sections over toward the fairgrounds. And we have a stormwater drainage system to carry runoff away from our roads and houses. Uh, as you'll see in Ned Huntley's presentation coming up, without these stormwater drains, we would have problems throughout the city with localized flooding and damaging erosion. I'd like to take a second, if I may, and just talk for a moment about the storm drains. If you stood on a ordinary street in the city, there'd be three sets of pipes under the city. The water pipes bringing drinking water to the house. Sewer pipes for when you flush the toilet. Then the third set of pipes, an entirely separate set of pipes, by law we're required to keep it separate, would be the storm drains, taking the water collected in catch basins along the curves and taking it off to some place which, for the most part, we're unaware of where that place is. In fact, it's a little rivers and brooks and streams around the city. So we have three goals tonight. We'd like to describe this flood control and the stormwater drainage system in a little more detail so that all of you are at least somewhat familiar with what's involved and 
have a sense of the scope and the scale of these systems. These are huge systems worth hundreds of millions of dollars, and they're really important to the infrastructure and the stability of our city in many ways. Secondly, we want to talk about some federal mandates that are coming up. These are going to impact the way we manage and maintain these two systems. Uh, on the flood control side, the Army Corps of Engineers wants us to increase the amount of maintenance work we do on the levees. They want us to make some improvements at the floodwater pumping station that's part of the levee system. And they want us to undertake some engineering studies to see if the levees as they are right now are first of all structurally stable, and secondly, are they sufficient to meet modern code requirements and modern floodwater potentials. On the, storm, on the drainage side, the EPA, which is the relevant agency here, also wants us to increase the amount of maintenance we're doing on the storm drains. They want us to initiate a fairly extensive program of uh, inspections throughout the year, and there's quite a bit of reporting involved. And finally, they want us to begin testing the water at the outfalls. I, I have a feeling they have their eye on um, certain types of pollution and fertilizer getting into the river. Finally, we're going to conclude our part of the presentation before the answer period by talking about the money. Uh, these new <coughs> requirements are going to be expensive, quite honestly. We've projected the cost, and we want to show you how we think they're going to impact the city's budget over the next several years. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ned Huntley, who's going to, as I said, describe these systems in much more detail, and I hope give you all a sense of exactly what we're talking about. picture here, this was actually uh, taken last year during Hurricane Irene down on Route 66. It was uh, about the first third of the flood control wall that we erected uh, for the Mill River. That's located down at the lower access road to Smith College uh, on Route 66. So a big overview, we have two systems uh, on the river. We have the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, uh, actually built both of them in 1940s. There's a series of levees or dike systems around the city of the low-lying areas and pump stations. And we have it on the Connecticut River and the Mill River. Uh, this is a diagram of the two systems. Uh, you can see Main Street, Pleasant Street. Over here are Pumray Terrace starting and wrapping all the way around. Right here is where the pump station is and back of the wastewater treatment plant off of Hockerman Road. And it carries over into the meadows on the Mill River, it starts at Paradise Pond, the dam, comes down and goes to over Route 66, or under Route 66, and there's a floodgate structure there also, and then there's what's called the Mill River Diversion Channel that runs the entire length all the way to the Oxbow uh, Connecticut River. Uh, there's also a pump station located on this, and the Mill River actually used to turn right here and meander all the way through downtown and ends up at this point. And that was diverted in 1940 as part of this project. This is a slide showing uh, flooding elevations if we did not have the flood system in place. This blue area here is flooding at elevation 127. And the Connecticut, uh, the Connecticut River typically flows at about 102 to 103. So this is about a 25, 26 foot jump in river height due to uh, large regional flooding. Um, it does not go quite to the height of the flood control system. Uh, the flood control system peaks out at 130. So the flooding effects would be a little bit more than what you're seeing here in this blue shading. But it gives you an indication of if we didn't have this flood system in place, where Connecticut River would want to go naturally. Uh, we pulled out the property values, the cost of failure, the system failed to uh, work properly. 
and you can see there's approximately 189 acres of water uh, in downtown now if the system fails. And these are the assessor values of the land and buildings. $200 million worth of properties will be affected. Uh, the total building values at $54 million. Uh, this is a picture of the Connecticut River in 2011. This is actually taken down at the Oxbow Marina. Uh, the river at that point received, uh, got to about elevation 218. This is another picture. This is actually the uh, flood control structure in the background off of Hawkman Road. And this is the river side of the Connecticut River uh, during that same flood. Uh, Connecticut River flood control. Uh, for those who people can't maybe picture distances, a mile is 5,200 feet, so there's almost a mile of the system here. There's two stop log structures that are erected by the DPW. They're big uh, 12 by 12 logs that interlock and build a wall with them, like you saw in the first photo on West Street. We have a 150,000 uh, gallon a minute pump station. Kind of give you an indication of how fast that pumps. Most people, or a lot of people have swimming pools in their backyard, four foot high above ground swimming pool. They could fill eight pools in one minute with these pumps running. Uh, another analogy is the fuel tankers that you see traveling down the road full of gasoline. We would fill 22 of those in a minute. So there's a lot of water that this thing <coughs> operates and pumps through. And what it's pumping, it's pumping down the water that's trapped inside the city behind the dike. When the Connecticut River gets so high, the water in back of it can't flow out, so it has to be pumped through the flood control wall. Um, and as Terry explained earlier, it includes the downtown areas of Maine, Pleasant Cons, and all the surrounding neighborhoods down there. So this is what the, looks like flooding with elevation 127 feet, which like I said is uh, uh, about 25 feet above normal st uh, stage of the river. And you can see the river is all contained in back of the walls on both sides. And this is, like I said, this is uh, another picture you kind of basically just saw is what happens if this system failed and the flooding that would occur downtown. Here's Pleasant Street, Main Street. Uh, this is out on Route 10 coming out of town here. A uh, picture most people have seen this picture before. This is the flood of 1936. Uh, right here is the corner of Pearl and Pleasant Street. And uh, that elevation of that flood was 129.4, which is a record for the Connecticut River. Like I said, our flood control system is built to withstand up to 130. So uh, this is what it looked like downtown because we had no system in place. And this is another photo of the Fitzwillie building is right over here. Uh, and this is the underpass under Main Street going into Bridge Street. This is the same flood of 1936. This is a, a cute little diagram of what flood control looks like. Basically, we have the Mill River on this side of the levee, we have our pump station, and then we have the river side. So it works on both sides that when the Connecticut River is high, the Mill River can't gravity flow out, so we have to put it through it and pump it out. Uh, likewise, uh, flood control was running a few weeks ago because the Mill River got high so fast, or the old Mill River Basin got uh, filled up and even though the Connecticut River was low, it still couldn't flow out. So we had to operate the pump station to push water out of the city also. So it works on both levels, not just when the Connecticut River is flooding, it works in both directions. Uh, this is a picture of the backside of the flood control station. Um, these are the three outlets for the three engines that pump and uh, pump the water out inside the city. This is actually Riverside, the other side is city side. This is a picture of one of the pump engines. These engines are 70 years old. They're Sterling engines. Each one is uh, approximately 425 horsepower. And uh, basically the water from the Mill River comes into these large chambers here. The, pump, the engines are running, the pump sucks up vertically and pushes out through the flood wall into the Connecticut River. And there's three in the line that work. Uh, small floods, we only wait for the operate one. Uh, heavy floods will operate all three at the same time. Likewise, on the other side of the city, we have the Mill River flood control. 
which has a levee or dike system of about a half a mile in length. The stock log structure on West Street is 14 feet tall because the Mill River flashes with local events while the Connecticut River rises more slowly and there are much bigger uh, regional events, New England-wide events. You see that rise up. We have a small pump station that pumps water from the street side of West Street over the wall into the Mill River. Uh, we have the concrete flood wall wood wood, uh, stop log structures also. We have uh, roughly uh, a good half mile of armored Mill River channel, which is riprap along the diversion course. And then we have a, literally a dam under the South Street Bridge, it's called the drop structure. Mm -hmm. And from there, it flows out about a mile and a half to the Connecticut River Oxbow. And this is a, a better close up of where it is. Uh, Smith College here, this is actually College Lane. Smith College Physical Plant is here. So Paradise Pond and the dam is here. And like I said, this is all created to divert the Mill River out of downtown back in uh, 1940. And uh, this is the picture that was on the front. This is the Mill River in August of 2011, uh, just shortly after Hurricane Irene. Uh, it actually came within about two feet of flooding, the sill there. So that was a pretty close call. I'm uh, glad that we erected the first portion of the wall. There's still another uh, roughly eight feet on top of that to also go up as the river rises. Uh, this is another picture of the Mill River during the same flood. Uh, this is up by uh, on Smith College uh, campus, looking down towards Route 66. Mm -hmm. And you can see the, the, uh, the water here rising up against the embankment. So now we have some of these mandates that are coming out from the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, we have engineering studies and maintenance requirements, and if I read the slides, seismic stability, hydraulics. Um, we have to do survey work, geotechnical borings. We're looking for, it has settled over the past 70 years and still has the same height as it was originally built to. And they've set deadline dates for the Mill River to be done in January of 2013 and the Connecticut River mm -hmm. in 2014 at this point. Um, next slide. We estimate the minimum cost for engineering and maintenance construction is about $1.2 million that need to be spent on both facilities. What we don't know is the deficiencies that we're gonna find if they find that the levee system is not uh, stable by seismic to an earthquake. There might have to be upgrades and work done on the levee system. Uh, they might find other deficiencies that we're gonna have to work on also, but those won't be known until we do the engineering studies. And then there's a mandate from the Army Corps to spend, we feel, about a million dollars at the flood control station with the trash rack systems and a nominal amount of other repair work that needs to be done that they noted in the deficiencies. Um, so that's it kind of on the flood control part of it, and we'll go into our stormwater infrastructure at this point. Um, I don't know if you want to open up now for any questions on flood control, you just want to carry through. I'd, I'd like to so what if we don't do the mandates? What if we just, you know, federal government has a lot of mandates, what happens? When, when he's All right, well, so we were taking questions on, Watch we're gonna take questions, but, okay. Yeah, if I may, um, uh, Ned's gonna take questions, and then you're gonna have to repeat the question so folks at home can understand what the question was, but just <coughs> be as simple as that. Have at it. Ned, when you said what a uh, million dollar mandate, work at the pumping station, is that in addition to the $1.2 million mandate, or is that part of it? Uh, Frank Contrada had a question about the uh, $1.2 million for engineering studies versus the $1 million for the construction activities. Those are separate things that have to be done, so it's actually $2.2 million. Okay. Uh, yeah, I have a question about the pump station. And basically, I know it was built about 75 years ago. So, and I was reading the um, the stormwater report that you published on the website about what could be done if you had an enterprise fund. And I noticed in the enterprise fund document, you say that for the city of Northampton now, you have about 200, a 
two, two square miles of infrastructure. When that pump station was built, what did they consider to be impervious surface? So basically the question is, is that pump station adequate for the amount of impervious surface we have today and what we'll have 20 years in the future? That's a good question, Fred. Uh, basically the question is, is uh, Fred is concerned that as we built out Northampton, we have more parking lots and buildings, more impervious areas, so ground, uh, stormwater can't flow into the ground. Um, is that pump station was designed to build that? This pump station was built and designed in 1940 for that current condition, and I'm not sure if they had other future projections of growth in the city. So is the pump station adequate today and for the next 20 years? That would be part of the studies that would be done. When did you, um, when were the mandates handed down? When did you get these mandates? We received the mandates for the um, Connecticut River and the Mill River in February of this year, 2012. Just ask where uh, residents of Northampton or other interested parties can seek out information. You can go to the Environmental Protection Agency website for some of it. You can go to the Army Corps of Engineers website for the New England Division. It would be the places I would send you right away. Um, and also, you can look at all these documents and reports on the DPW website. They're all posted there, everything that we have. This presentation will be posted on uh, Monday during the day. What happens if people do not have a computer? I got a call today from somebody on Gil Rain Cares who does not have a computer. So can they come to your office to get that information? We don't have a printed. Council of Arch asked um, if residents that don't have internet connections or access to computers, how would they be able to get that information? Uh, I assume that they can go to libraries and get the information. I believe libraries also have free internet access also. Uh, Public Works has limited uh, information. We use extensively the internet also. As we try to save paper, we don't have a lot of documents printed out because of that. But it is available. Um, I would assume that DP down in Springfield has these documents in print also. Department of Environmental Protection. Thank you. Question up there. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm wondering if you... Just you your name, please. Oh, Nana Rye, Annie Rose, please. Um, there's 1.2 million in engineering studies. Those are for accreditation for FEMA. They're not for accreditation. Not mandated. They're, they're a mandate. Um, basically, they're looking at what we call data gaps, information they don't have, and it's going to take geotechnical engineers and engineers to come up uh, whether or not this system can withstand the current event. And then the 1 million the pump station is that broken out yet do we, do we still have to study the pump station to determine the well we need to um now also asked about the pump station and the million dollars and it is broken out in the february letter from the army corps of engineers this is also online on our website and that's connecticut river one excuse me And basically, at flood control, which you were asking about, it is asked that, oops, it is asked that uh, we replace the basement and heating, uh, the basement heating areas to reduce humidity and protect the equipment, replace the operating floor and wet well ventilation fans to meet current standards, uh, repair internal and exterior brickwork, repair, repair, replace broken glass blocks, replace the manually operated trash racks, which is the big expense, um, and remove corrosion from all pipes and uh, have them cleaned and repainted. So those are the, the requirements. There's a lot of other suggestions and considerations that they ask us to do. And like I said, both these letters are online on our website. <coughs> Mike Kirby, um, this is fairly modest compared to the 
figures in the CDM study for the uh, where they projected uh, something like a $15 million figure to replace the pumping station essentially with a state of the art? So they are modest. Uh, Mr. Kirby asked about why the difference of price versus the CDM report, which was the stormwater flood control report that was commissioned by the Department of Public Works. Uh, basically, they looked at replacing the pump station. They felt that it's antiquated enough that it deserves replacement, and the cost was $18 million in the report. But we're here to discuss uh, the problems that we're having and the minimum mandates that we need to do to fix the problems that we're having, and not the huge other projects that are listed in the CDM report. All right. Barry, you had a question? Yeah, I, I know that the DPW is always asking for money because it's a big job in the city. Um, I know that they asked for quite a bit of money for the, some dumpsters or something, and they wanted to redo the uh, the maintenance uh, sh shop where you do your work. So I, I know this. Uh, I guess my question was, where is the list of priority of what is mandated, must be done, and the wish list, so that there's a list we can look down and say, okay, this has to be done, this, this can wait. And order our priorities as mandated, as, and as needed. Mr. Roth asked about the priorities of the city and the Department of Public Works, and whether or not we had that list accomplished. We are actually in the midst of a number of studies. This is one of the studies that was commissioned, stormwater flood control. We're also working on a water asset management plan at this time and we're about three quarters of the way through a comprehensive wastewater management plan. So in the upcoming year, year and a half at the latest, you're gonna see a combination of all these infrastructure needs come together and be evaluated, <coughs> and that way that discussion can happen and which ones need to be prioritized. So we don't have the exact list that you're looking for today, but it is forthcoming through the study work that we're doing. So we're going to go into stormwater now, our aging stormwater infrastructure. And basically, a lot of the system is well in excess of 100 years old. It's under capacity in a number of areas. That's due to the fact that as we've separated the sewer systems from the stormwater systems, the old sewer pipes were left for the stormwater systems. So instead of a standard 12-inch pipe for stormwater, we have 8-inch pipes, we have 10-inch pipes that don't really have the capacity to serve. Uh, there's some areas that uh, don't have drainage systems and we need improvements, and there's extremely limited fund for any kind of drainage work going on in the city. Uh, in the past, it's always been bonded through a general bond to do work on city streets for anything that has to do with stormwater work. Uh, this is an overall picture of all of Northampton. Uh, here's the downtown area. Obviously, the Connecticut River for orientation of Route 91. Uh, next photo is 4,835 <laughs> catchphrases. This is, they're everywhere. They're in every single ward. They're across the city with a bigger emphasis in the downtown. Uh, the 4,800 also includes the Interstate 91, even though we don't maintain them. Their water comes where our water goes to. So it's all the shared. Uh, Finding the water cooling to the same place. Next slide. Uh, we have 114 miles of pipe, 190 culverts and drainage channels across the city. Uh, that's what <coughs> the water comes from the catch basin, it moves these pipes, and it dumps them into what we call outfalls, which is the next slide. And we have 326 outfalls in the city where this water ends up. It usually ends up in marshes, wetlands, streams, eventually going to the rivers. Uh, this is a picture of Main Street, uh, uh, downtown Northampton, during a flooding event, and you can see our system was surcharged. It's actually coming up out of the stormwater manhole. Uh, this is North Street, across from Dunkin' Donuts, uh, during heavy rain events. This area, and also Main Street, uh, where you saw the, one of the first pictures of the, the 36 flood, that also looks the same way under heavy rain events. Uh, the system doesn't have the capacity to serve. 
This is off of Hatfield Street. This happened uh, about a year and a half ago, or actually a year ago. Uh, notice the yellow line here. This is an exposed gas line now. We fixed that, but this was an outfall that just got overwhelmed and blew apart on us. So this was an emergency repair that we did. This was Prospect Street down by the Water Department. Uh, there was a big stone culvert that was built in the mid 1800s there and it collapsed. So uh, we had to spend about, in 2004, about $29,000 fixing this for the emergency contractor. Uh, this is an undersized pipe up on Florence Street. Uh, it had too much water going through it and it blew out and tore up the roadway and blew up the drainage system. And this is a, a constant problem we have down at uh, Elm Riverside and Milton. Uh, the car service repair shop is here with us. And this is just a recent time also. This last event was in 2012. That's where this picture comes from. Uh, this is Austin Circle. The problem we're having in uh, the backyards of uh, a number of residents in that Austin Circle where uh, drains all comes to a a swale that hasn't been maintained and updated and there's no place for it to go to, except to flood out now. So now we're gonna break into our new uh, stormwater permit and the mandates that are coming out of this. So basically we started working with the EPA in 2003, that was our first permit. And we've done it with a little amount of money with a part-time planner a nominal amount of money from uh, a budget to do basically the work that we required in that permit. We're getting ready to enter our, no, our newer permit, which is uh, much more stringent than the first. They're looking for a number of points that we have to do underneath that permit. And um, we expect that the increase for operation and maintenance, which is a budget <coughs> that includes personnel services, is $525,000 a year. And we're expecting this permit to be released almost any time now. So it's coming at us and it is a federal mandate. I'll give you some examples of what we do with catch basins. This is a, uh, a clamshell. It's actually cleaning a catch basin. Uh, we go around and try to get as many catch basins as we can in the nine months that we can before winter comes. We don't get them all. Underneath the new mandate, we're going to be required to get them done, I believe, twice a year, Doug, is that correct? At 50% capacity. So it's going to expand our efforts that we're going to have to do to clean the street sweepings, the dirt, the grit, the stuff that collects in these catch basins on the side of the road. Uh, this is a Bacter truck. Uh, this is a, a truck we bought two years ago. Um, it does sewer repairs and also does drain work. So they're cleaning out a catch base from this, but also to clean sewer lines. So it's a combination vehicle. Uh, this vehicle was almost $300,000 to purchase. So the equipment's not cheap to maintain these systems that we have in place also. This is a, a street sweeper. Uh, currently now, it takes two people eight hours a day, about four months to sweep the city once. Underneath the new mandate, we're gonna be required to do it twice a year. Uh, the street sweepers are lucky if they make it 10 years because of all the grit and dirt and dust, uh, real abrasive work on the equipment. And these uh, street sweepers are about $150,000 each to replace. So we have two in the city. One is about seven years old. The other one is two years old. So we expect that with, with double the duty life they're gonna be put into, probably the operational change over them or just buying new ones are gonna happen every five to seven years instead of <coughs> Uh, this is a picture of an outfall off of uh, Hampton Avenue. The state or the EPA is going to require that we sample 25% of our outfalls the first year, another 25% the next year for E. coli bacteria, nitrogen, pH, temperature, a uh, list of constituents, uh, and there's 326 of them, so there's about 80 that we're going to have to sample and send out to lab analysis this first year. 
Uh, one of the other mandates is green infrastructure. The, instead of dumping water into streams and rivers, they want to see it entered back into the groundwater table. So uh, these are groundwater quality swales. This is actually one that was built in front of the Daily Hampshire Gazette when we did uh, concert over this past year. So it's, it's a way of filtering out contaminants in stormwater before it reaches a pipeline that shoots to a stream or a river. It gives a chance to cleanse itself and actually recharges groundwater instead of just moving it away from the city. Uh, this was a project that uh, Doug McDonald did uh, back in 2003-2004, uh, public education. Uh, these these uh, metal decals went on a bunch of catch basins at the street, basically trying to inform the, uh, the people of Northampton that if you don't do this, it's going to end up in the river and it could affect some of the, the aquatic life. Yeah. We're required to do eight new public information notices in this upcoming five-year permit. Uh, other mandates in the permit is illicit discharge and detection. Basically, uh, any violation they find in the permit, we have to correct within a 30-day period. They want nitrogen reduction by 10% citywide. Uh, Long Island Sound is the end receiving water body of all our city water. So overall, between the wastewater plant and stormwater, we want to see this 10% reduction. We've done some pilot studies at the wastewater treatment plant where we had a reduction, but uh, it's not the 10%. So we're gonna have to start doing some kind of work on our stormwater also to do some cleansing. Hence these uh, 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 swales and uh, other green infrastructure that we're trying to do with this permit. And the last part of this is the municipal floor inspection. We're required to, in the first year of the permit go into every municipal building and inspect the floor drains to ensure that they go into the sanitary system and not the storm system. So that's another mandate in this permit. On top of all this, <laughs> we also have Bridget, uh, river and brook erosion threats. Um, as, the, as it says, you know, we, we are blessed with beautiful rivers and brooks in the community, but we have stream bank erosion also. There's no funding for these. And we are aggressively looking at grants to do these. We actually have uh, NEMA grants uh, for two of our projects right now that are being reviewed. If you go to the next slide, Doug. This is one of the first ones. This is a $1.6 million project on River Road in Leeds, basically from the Leading Church town line to about uh, where the Overlook entrance is. <coughs> uh, this is a hole in the wall that's current, and the rest of the wall is undulating as it's collapsing downward into the river. We've applied for a $1.6 million grant. It is a 75% reimbursable, so the city would still have to come up with $400,000 uh, to pay their share of it. Uh, it's been approved by NEMA, the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency, and recommended for funding to the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA. We're still working in details out with FEMA, and hoping the next year we'll see funding for this particular project. This is another one, which is the Mill River uh, retaining wall off of Federal Street. We have a large sewer interceptor on the back of this wall also. We did some temporary repairs, um, I believe about five years ago on it, but they're not permanently repaired. At some point, this wall is gonna have to be replaced also. We don't have any funding in place or uh, grants in place for this one yet. This is a current situation that's developed in the past few years uh, just below Musaini Beach. Uh, if you go in the lower parking lot of Musaini Beach, this is uh, the mm. Roberts Meadow Brook trying to find a new courseway. And it's going into this bank here and leading straight towards this house. Uh, we have a MEMA grant uh, that was recommended for funding. It's at the federal level being reviewed right now. This is a $500,000 project. Once again, it would be a 75-25 split. So we would have, the uh, city would have to come up with about $125,000 if we get the grant. <coughs> and I'm gonna turn this over to Terry, uh, who's gonna take us through the budget discussion. Actually, uh, do, does anyone have a question about what uh, <coughs> they just presented? Uh, what is the plan for that? Is there anything at all? 
There's currently not anything planned for Florence in particular. Uh, the CDM report paints a bigger picture across the city of infrastructure needs that could be done in the next 20 years. But I don't believe there's anything in particular for Florence, Mary, and I'm not sure what areas you're talking about that are problematic. Um, Acre Brook Road and the, I mean the Austin Circle. Okay. All those basements are wet all year long. Well, we I guess we have to slide up here earlier about Austin Circle yeah. mm -hmm. and the fact that when that subdivision was created, there was a man-made drainage swale in the backyards, and over the years it's filled in. There is no real swale now, and with that, the water can't go anywhere. It just spreads out and floods mm -hmm. that area. Well, um, the responsibility that, is that? that was identified in the report um, as a potential project with a cost of about $1.5 million to fix. Mm -hmm. Talk about Donnelly and the priority list is that? We haven't made the priority list yet. Just so you know, this is this is a discussion about our core needs that we need to do now, and then we have all the projects over here that need to get done. And the city's gonna have to decide which projects are critical to get done and, and basically prioritize them. And who makes that decision? That will be done by the Board of Public Works with the City Council. Uh, city Council's gonna have to appropriate the money because <coughs> The Board of Public Works doesn't have it. Uh, uh, just, just in general, um, I've never seen a community that has so much tearing down of wood in construction of new housing projects. Uh, it, it boggles my mind. Uh, and I'm wondering what pushback, if any, uh, the DPW has with the government in the way it's allowing the unbelievable amount of construction that is going on in the community. Because I, I would assume that all that construction is what ultimately exacerbates all the problems with the sewage and so on and so forth. It just makes common sense. Mr. Roth had questions about the uh, development of the city and uh, new developments that are taking place in the city subdivisions. Those are all regulated by the subdivision rules and regulations. We ensure the city that they're built according to our standards, our engineering standards. But you're, you were talking about, you know, the excessive stormwater that might come out of the development. When these developments are built, they have to do what is called pre and post development flows for stormwater. So basically, they look at the site before in, in its existing condition, and they calculate what the flow of stormwater is coming off that site, and then they build it up with impervious areas, roadways, and rooftops, and so on. The amount of water has to leave at the same rate. However, the rate will be over an extended period of time. So the pre-post construction flows leaving the site are the same, they're just longer in duration. So they technically, they don't have a overwhelming effect on the capacity of the system. They just use the system for a longer period of time. So it's a big mystery how we got to this point. And, and in fact, you're not pushing back against it. We have Subdivision rules related to the city, and that's what we follow. So your your what your conversation is is with the planning board and how to stop straw. I'm sorry. Your conversation will be with the planning board or the city council or how to enact more stringent regulations in the city to start this to stop the urban sprawl, and you discuss it. Yeah, I, I yeah, but I'm asking you. Uh, I see correlation, and I think that you should be giving some input uh, to that effect. Maybe I'm wrong. But it, it seems like it's just common sense. We, we review every single subdivision in the city to make sure that it has sewer capacity, stormwater capacity, water capacity to serve. We review the road system to make sure it meets our standard. So DPW has a lot of input into it. We're not the final approving source. The planning board is that. Is there any other questions? Uh, Rick Clark, Williams Street. Um, you were talking about the 10% reduction testing that you're going to do. Is that a mandate? Yes, it is. It, it is. And, and does that combine, does the 10% come from reduction in both sewage and storm? Or? Yes. It, so the testing or the results will be for both of that? It will be. So um, I guess my question is, is there um, ultimately a plan however far down the road where we'll have to treat the stormwater. Will that be gathered 
getting a central, like the, the sewage uh, treatment, will that, will we have to consider that at some I'm point? I'm hoping we don't have to go to that extent. Yeah. But we've already seen upgrades of the system over the years, such as, I think they call it storm center, which is a way of collecting fine particles of silt and dirt in a storm system and letting it drop out before it goes to the river. So there is some things that we have kind of cleansing the system. I think the bigger push is going to be at the wastewater treatment plant for nitrogen reduction. Uh, we did a study uh, this past year and we were able to get it down a bit, but I don't believe it makes it to 10%. So as we go through the comprehensive wastewater management plan, we're going to identify a number of things that need to happen at the wastewater treatment plant in the future. We also have our new, what they call the NIFTES permit coming out in 2013, which is the discharge of wastewater from the plant. It's a federal permit, and they may dictate the amount of nitrogen that we can use. So we might have to do some extensive upgrades to the wastewater treatment plant to meet those, and we just don't know what the permit's gonna say yet. Right, but there's nothing as far as stormwater treatment. Um, I think the best stormwater treatment is probably through a series of swales and um, uh, man-made features to help reduce the amount of sediment that leaves the site and also the cleansing through uh, percolation into the ground. Right, if, I, if I might add, the EPA is asking for uh, green infrastructure to be built, um, vegetated swales. That's really the only way to remove nitrogen from the water. Um, and, and that's part of the, the EPA Yeah, this is Doug McDonald. He's with the Department of Public Works. He's our stormwater coordinator and our planner. Doug, would you like to go to Mike right there in front of you? Cindy, right? Colleen, Colleen sorry. Uh, ask a question about are there other communities doing the same things that we'll be looking at doing? No, 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 no. sorry, no. Are there other communities who treat their stormwater like wastewater along the Connecticut River? The only communities that treat their water like wastewater would be ones that have combined systems <coughs> and they're offloaded to the treatment plant. They're supposed to be separated systems now, but there are probably some of the older communities have combined systems still. But not that I'm aware of that anyone is treating stormwater as a separate process in a treatment facility. Thank you. Um, so the next phase. Oh, I, yeah, just for, I wanted to recognize Marianne Labarge from Ward 6 in uh, the Council for Ward 6 and Morgan Carney in the Council for Ward 1 that are also here. But I wanted to also get back to uh, the question that Fred Zimnock had about pump station design and the pictures of Florence Street in Lees. All it, 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 this goes right into stormwater also, not just flood control. The I think that pipe on Florence Street in Lees was put in, in the 1800s. Um, and there's a lot of them in the city of Northampton. So I, I don't think anything uh, in our stormwater, or very, very little of our stormwater system has been designed, uh, I think, for, for the today's flow. I don't think any of it is. I think that's, that's 
that's part of the that's part yeah. of the problem. And that's one thing that we're going to have to uh, uh, address. That's what this is all about. Um, we one of the big problems of the lease through when you saw the Florence uh, excuse me, the River Road retaining wall that's falling. There's also a sewer main in there, a ten inch sewer main that comes from the town of Williamsburg that pumps 125,000 gallons of sewage down that street to our Northampton wastewater treatment plant. So that's also a problem. Should that wall fail, that sewage will be in the river. So there's a lot of things that we don't even think about that are, that are out there. And all of this stuff that, that we're depending on has been constructed uh, in the 1800s. Uh, and it's, it's really, it's not a, it's not a joke. It, that includes our water system and sewer. And the catch basins are not cleaned out by your sewer enterprise fund. That's one uh, misconception. I get a lot of calls about that today. They think the catch basins are being cleaned out with, with your sewer money. It's not the case. Uh, it's, it, it's come out of the, out of the DPW's general fund. So, and when you saw that slide up to 4,000 catch basins in the city of North, it was a daunting task to try and keep up with that. Um, and, and, and I just didn't want anybody to go away thinking that your catch basins are cleaned out with the money that you pay for your sewer enterprise fund, because that does not happen. Um, and Also, on uh, Brick Street, we have storm drain that's some 20 feet deep. When we had to separate the sewer from the storm system, we still we used the old, as we abandoned some of the sewer, we used that for storm drain. Yeah. So it, it's very difficult. I mean, th this, is, this is old stuff that's been hanging around here, and it really is. Uh, we might not want to address it, but it's a time bomb. It's a time bomb all over the city, everywhere. So it's something that uh, um, brings me back to what I said before. I, I was hoping that more people would have showed up here to this. I thought uh, there would be a huge, when I went by and saw all the cars out in the parking lot, I went, oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> and in, there was more people in here. And then as the meeting got started, we ended up with 35 or 40 people here. But, um, I think, uh, and this is going to be uh, a little more outreach, I think, because this is going to be the first, I think, of a series of these forums where people really, we have to pay attention to what's going on here. Somewhere along the line, somebody's got to fix this stuff. And we don't know how it's going to get done. We haven't got a clue at this point. That's what this is all about. People ask me, well, where is this going? Is there going to be a vote here or something tonight? Well, there's not. This is informational and educational. And uh, I think uh, we'll leave here if you have neighbors that you want to talk to or something. It's important that the next time we have one of these meetings, that we actually have more people here. Thank you. Uh, so I, I think uh, a fairly obvious question after a presentation like this would be, what if we don't comply? Uh, the economy's in a tough spot. Our tax dollars are certainly being stretched as far as we can possibly be stretched. What if we say no? What's going to happen? Uh, first, let's look at the flood control system. The uh, Army Corps of Engineers rates levy systems as either being acceptable, minim minimally acceptable, which is what we have, it's the borderline, or inactive. In other words, if we fail to maintain the levy system, to at least minimal standards, they consider it to be as if it weren't there. It's inactive. The next thing that would follow behind that is FEMA, when they draw the flood zone maps for this area, would draw the map as if there was no levee. So suddenly the flood zone that stops at the levee would incur, in, in, incur into the uh, neighborhoods all around that section of the city. I talked to my banker, the banker that holds our mortgage, and she told me that if that were to happen, all of those mortgages in those neighborhoods would be in technical default. Mm -hmm. Next thing they would do is contact their customers in those neighborhoods and ask them to secure flood insurance. If within 90 days they had not secured flood insurance, 
the bank would secure it for them at a higher price. It would certainly, I think, affect property values in those neighborhoods. Uh, it's hard to imagine we could let that happen. If you look at the stormwater drainage system, that falls under, because we take the water and dump it into streams and brooks and wetlands, which are under the control of the EPA, how we handle stormwater and what we do with it falls under the control of the EPA. If we didn't dump it into brooks and streams, they wouldn't care. We could <coughs> keep it in a big tank somewhere. But once we dump it into public waterways, it's their business. Early on in the permit, there's a section called duty to comply. Any failure of ours to meet the requirements of the permit become a violation of the Federal Clean Water Act. Uh, fines range up to as much as $50,000 per day. I, I assume things would have to, we practically, practically have to be opposed by that, but basically the fines begin at $2,000 a day and quickly escalate. So those are the two steps, redrawing the flood zone maps and violating the Clean Water Act. I think there's, a, on the other side of the coin, I think there's another point that's, that's worth I think considering. Generations of Northampton residents have built these systems, as you've heard, over the last 130 years. Uh, at times, millions of dollars of federal money have gone into these systems. No one's asking us to expand them or to make them fancy. They're asking us to maintain them and keep them in working order. I, I have to say, I, I, it seems like a reasonable request personal opinion. All right, so let's have the first slide. So what we've tried to do, and I'd like to stress, the, I'd like to stress the fact that we've, first of all, this slide is available on a handout. Can't read so either. You, right, it's available as a handout. <laughs> it's Can't on read the it. city website, and, and it's here. Um, I'd like to stress that what we've put into these slides are only mandated programs. Uh, there's nothing that we would like to do or think we ought to do here or that we think we should be considering. This is just mandated work. So this is what we spent last year. This is all money that's already been spent. Essentially, we spent about $275,000 on the projects that you've heard about here, stormwater and flood. And we spent about $64,000 on the Con Street drainage system when we repaved Con Street. Also, the city is paying about $67,000 in bonding for previous projects. So altogether, we spent about $400,000 last year on projects related to the two systems we're talking about, stormwater and flood control. This year, year we're in right this moment. We think the 273,000, well, a little bit, maybe 275,000 for stormwater and flood control operations. We expect to spend about 225,000, I'm going to skip this section for a moment, $225,000 for the repaving North Street. We're going to rebuild the drain system underneath North Street as we rebuild that street. Now let's talk about the mandates. We can't get out some days. <laughs> These are the increased costs that we would incur if we meet all of the EPA standards or requirements that they have for the storm drains. Uh, we need, we believe, another vehicle for cleaning the catch basins. If we're required to clean the catch basin twice a year, almost 5,000 catch basins, that's 10,000 cleaning events per year, approximately, not quite. If we do it during the better parts of the year, not the winter weather, say over nine months, we have to clean a catch basin about every 10 minutes. It's gonna take two crews and more equipment to maintain that level of service. The total cost in the first year, we're assuming it'll be a partial year, might be around $300,000. It really depends on when the permit comes out, and it depends on how much 
much of our fiscal year is left at that point. Down here is debt service related to the upgrades and the repairs and the flood control system. There's a little bit of debt, remember the 67,000 for previous projects, projects that are long done, we just paying off the bonds at this point. So there's about $68,000 for that. And then we anticipate future debt for levy repair, pump station repairs, and levy certification uh, studies. We also put in here, not mandated perhaps, the two projects Ned was talking about earlier. That stream erosion that's approaching that house. If we pay, spend the money to fix that stream erosion, FEMA will give us back 75% of it, we believe. <coughs> but we have to spend the money first before we can get the money back. That's the way that particular program works. So we put that in there. We think that makes sense to do the river road retaining wall. That's the road out in Leeds where the uh, sewer interceptor line is. And we think it makes sense to fix that brook that's moving toward that guy's house because we're going to get most of that money back. So those are the only two things in here in this new line that are not strictly speaking mandated or that we're not being told we have to do. So suddenly the $405,000 from last year becomes a million two for this fiscal year, the one we're in right now. If an EPA permit comes out and with say half of a year left, and if we go ahead with these repairs and upgrades to the flood water control system. At that point, it's just a matter of extending it out. Again, this section here is related to storm water. This is our ongoing, this is what we do every year for storm water and flood control. And these are these costs for these upgrades to the levy system moving forward. Our 400,000 becomes a million two, it becomes a million six once all of these things kick in for a full year, and then it goes forward at roughly that rate. So it's approximately a million dollars, more than a million dollars, more than we're spending right now. And at this point, we're just bringing this information to the public. Uh, we're open to comments, we're open to thoughts, we're open to any ideas anyone may have as to how we should pay for this. As Gene Tacey mentioned earlier, it's important to understand all of this money comes from the general fund, the same pool of money that pays for the police, fire, schools, just the general fund of the city. There's no enterprise fund involved here. It's not sewer money. It's not drinking water money. It's just the general fund. So somehow the city is going to have to find about a million two in new money going forward in order to comply with these mandates. Council Member Mark. Yes, um, Terry, is this um, the EPA permits the mandatory part of all this? Is this throughout the whole state or just here? Well, it's commu every community who discharges stormwater has to have a permit. Uh, so every community within the state that has stormwater discharge would have one. Okay, and so for... So Ned, Ned has a qualification for that. But you have to be a certain density of, of uh, the uh, city. So uh, Northampton is included in the Springfield metropolitan area, and that's why we have to have that. A very rural town would have to have that. Doesn't Westfield have Westfield. something similar? I got a call on that today. But there is, is only twenty dollars a year. That's what they pay. They're they have an enterprise fund. They have an enterprise fund. But they you were asking about the stormwater permit. They have a storm right. have to get a stormwater My permit. My question, Terry, to you is thank you very much. Is Austin Circle, because I've been working with Ned very closely, having meetings and so forth. This has been going on, which we know for over thirty years in that site. Also, Briarwood, which I have a resident who lives right near where one of the problems is. Well, My your, question your, quest your question actually makes me realize I skipped something. I'd like to circle back. To okay, that. okay. There is something that happens over here that I forgot to mention. Moving forward, 
we are proposing that the city consider spending a fixed amount of money every year so we can predictably tackle projects like Austin Circle. At the moment, there's no real pool of money that we can tap to go after a project. For example, Austin Circle is a million five. One point two. We're suggesting, and that's a fairly small project, you probably know this. We're suggesting only that the city consider putting aside a quarter of a million dollars a year, two hundred fifty thousand dollars per year, moving forward every year, <coughs> that we can start using to tackle small projects as they come up, or larger projects, but we might have to save up for two or three years for a larger project. So in this budget, we're suggesting that the city ought to be spending a quarter of a million dollars, or more, frankly, to work on new projects. And we're also proposing that the city spend $30,000 a year on those granite swales, like the one in front of the Hampshire Gazette. Now, perhaps this is too modest a goal. And it's, it certainly would take a while to ever tackle something like Austin Circle. But so this number is certainly up for discussion. Well, how big should that number be? <coughs> right, because that's my question here. It's because of the amount of damage that has been done within the past couple of years with the flooding in their basements and so forth. How much longer can people wait to have a good quality of life at that site? Because right. they don't have one. Well, right now, any money to work on that problem would compete. Right now, any money available to work on that problem would compete with police, fire, schools. It directly compete. Uh, do we hire a teacher? We put aside some money for Austin Circle. Do we hire a fireman? <coughs> we put aside some more money for Austin Circle. Paul, Michael. Yeah. I think, uh, Council, that, that's, I think, really the Forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> I went to the next one. We'll go to Mary and then come back here if it comes up. Yeah, my question has to do with the coordination between the Department of Public Works and the Office of Planning and Development. We've seen um, a rezoning of King Street to encourage development. All well and good. We'll probably be seeing more in the way of impervious surfaces. These are the sort of things that contribute to more stormwater runoff. To what extent are the taxpayers and ratepayers being expected to? 
to pay for increased runoff that's coming that will probably be coming about as the result of the redevelopment of, of King Street and other large developments involving impervious surfaces, large parking lots, and the like. Uh, so Mary wonders how taxpayers uh, are going to handle the increasing expenses for runoff from uh, parking lots in large developments, car dealerships, supermarkets, uh, malls, that sort of thing. Right. It's not just how taxpayers, but it's like where's the coordination between DPW and OPD when we're looking at, at the development at these large developments? Are there requirements in place for stormwater management on site? For are, are, is the redevelopment of King Street going to increase our stormwater runoff? I, I think the short answer is probably yes. Uh, mm -hmm. The planning department manages that whole process of getting a development or a large uh, shopping center through. They ask for our input, and we look at the technical specifications of the roads, the parking lots, the curbing, the drainage. Um, working within the laws of the city, however, I have to say, over the 17 years or so I've been on the Board of Public Works, there's occasional hand-wringing on our side that uh, yet, here's yet another street we have to accept because they don't comply with all of the town's zoning and planning board regulations. Uh, at that point, the Board of Public Works and the Department of Public Works feels that these people have met all of the criteria set up by the planning board and the zoning board. At that point, or we just say no. Uh, Doug, would you take <coughs> I can talk for you loud. Uh, <coughs> Doug McDonald actually does all the technical reviews of stormwater in the city, so you can have well more than answer that question of uh, a new mall coming in or redevelopment of King Street. And I talked earlier about pre and post development flows coming out of the site. The sites have to meet the same thing, do they not, Doug? They do. They do. It, it, um, if a project's big enough that it's serving over one acre and has to be getting from our management permit from the DPW. We would work closely with the planning department. They have to meet the state standards for stormwater. They can't increase the fee flows. They have to recharge groundwater and they have to treat the, the stormwater. <coughs> so they have to meet our standards. We're, we're working for over one acre. For over one acre. Under one acre. Um, we don't have Another comment I would make about this is, in some communities, there's a fee associated with the amount of impervious area commercial projects have, and that's one that would be one way to possibly compensate for the fact that some businesses have large parking lots, some have small parking lots. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Michael, you had a question. Maria, you still have a question? Yeah, but he just answered it. <laughs> the, <laughs> the, 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 I would the question. The, the, the question was, um, I think the DP, whatever that study was, proposed a formula to whereby the amount of impervious area uh, determines how much you're assessed. And they were saying, make it a separate fund to deal with it, mm -hmm. which would lead a lot of people to tear up their driveways, I think, you know. But uh, maybe not. <laughs> but go ahead. That's what I was uh, asking. Well, I have a gravel driveway, so I, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's certainly one of the ideas out there. Uh, they came back with a number of ideas in that report. We're not here to recommend uh, the best choice or even to say we, we know what the best choice is. Tonight we're trying to get the public involved in this question, get them interested. Um, I would like to know what is being done to North Street. There's just a cemetery and there's a, there's a sports field. Why is money spent on that when houses are being flooded? Why, why 
is not not fit a project. If I may, uh, I'll, I'll field that as the policy. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, the, the, there, there are dedicated funds to dedicated projects, and the, the thing is, is that you know subsidizing. There is the general fund, and it's distributed uh, to pay for all the things that we've listed. You know, emergency uh, responders, uh, school systems. And, and the infrastructure to some degree, although there's some enterprise funds that also protect that. The, the building of the soccer fields is a, is a series of grants that are appealed to uh, and solicited by the state that are supposed to be dedicated to those projects. You can't take that money then that you're getting for specific projects and applications and then put it towards projects that may actually have a higher priority. And this is actually part of the bigger question that we're discussing is because right now the mandates um, to some degree actually conform with the community's priorities. I mean, it's clear as, we've, as it's been laid out to you tonight that we have to invest in these systems. But the fact is, is now we have no choice. We're being told by the federal mm -hmm. government we have no choice. I, I studied at the, the feet of um, the, the Yoda of the Department of Public Works, uh, Jim Dostal, who actually, <laughs> uh, who actually <laughs> phrased it pretty aptly was he said, you know, once upon a time, back when we were a socialist country, the federal government paid to build the dikes and levees and paid for these emergency systems. And things got a little tighter. We decided that we were going to reduce income taxes and reduce tax loads. And then the federal government gave us low interest loans that were project specific. We don't get that anymore. We, for the most part, low interest loans, with the exception of the, of the couple of projects that were explained here about erosion. Uh, the FEMA, which is a federal agency, will pay 75% of the project. For the most part, we're on our own. What we do get is nice pieces of paper in the mail. Well, actually, now it comes on the internet for the most part that say you have to do these things. You have to maintain your infrastructure. We gave you the infrastructure. Now you have to maintain it. It's not a question of whether you think it's nice. It's a question that you now have to do it. And you got to come up with the money. And this is what we've done as a culture, we have come to terms with how we're going to subsidize our systems, our federal, our, 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 the, the things that we come to rely on, we pay taxes on them. <coughs> then, for instance, we created Proposition 2.5, and, a half, and we, were going to, we couldn't raise taxes anymore to be on a certain level, but it's not like those projects and all the needs went away. So what was created were things like enterprise funds and fees and stuff like that, and unfortunately what that's created I mean, it's good because it's project specific, but the one thing that it's created is an additional layer between the public and the and the allocation of funds and the priorities. And uh, so th th that's part of the challenge that's laid out before us. So we're playing with the hand that we're dealt. And that's what actually drives, that's why we're all congregating here tonight because we have to as collectively as a community come to terms with the hand that we're dealt. We can't yell about the hand we wish we had. Yeah. If I can add uh, something else about North Street. We have a uh, pavement management program. This is software we pay an annual fee for it. And it analyzes all of the streets in Manhattan. Uh, it looks at things like, is it, uh, what's the traffic load on the street? How many houses are on the street? Is it a connector street or is it a dead end? It looks at all of the factors and it ranks the streets that need to be repaved in order of priority. It's been a terrific boon. It, to some extent, takes the politics out of it. It lets us all look at a definitive list of what's next as far as projects. North Street is up. But why? Because the pavement management program has identified North Street as the next most important street to the city that's paved. Since we're ripping the street up, feeling is that it would be practically criminal not to take a look at the pipes and the infrastructure below the street. The gas companies are redoing the gas lines, we're redoing the sewer lines, the storm drain lines. It just makes no sense to rip a street up and not deal with the infrastructure below the pavement. <laughs> so that's why we're spending, we have grain money. We, we have a lot of hands on, I just, I just want to, uh, and, I, and I'm responsible for this war, wandered a little off course. So let's, because we will, as I said, this is an ongoing conversation. Join your next Jim Dossel's 
after that, Barbara, somebody else had their hands up. Other council of our I, I just wanted to add one thing. What you failed to say, Terry, is Chapter 90 funds that can only be spent on streets are the reason why we're doing North Street, because we got Chapter 90 right. funds. And we can't spend that on anything else. That's, right. That's mandated to go to streets. So once you do the street, as you said, you got to look at the sewer line, the water line, the drain line, because, again, it would be criminal to do that street without redoing the lines underneath. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, to the politician, uh, would it be the city council uh, that we uh, the discussion of perhaps a moratorium on stormwater, uh, additional stormwater? I know in Wade Street, Brooklyn, when they were doing the College Street or College Church parking lot, it, uh, I believe planning may have put a moratorium on additional water into the brook. You, that's something that all right, you, you were asking for, well, at first I thought you were asking us to put a moratorium on, on stormwater, and if that were possible, we would just simply say, because <laughs> you're conferring upon us great powers to actually stop water from flowing. <laughs> but, uh, um, yes, the council actually is, we are, uh, the council and the Office of Planning and Development, um, we can, through uh, negotiation and ordinance and zoning, we can regulate as some of the things that Doug talked about are incorporated in planning st stages for any type of water. Um, I take some issue with Mr. Roth's disposition or expression that, 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 that we have rampant um, external growth here. That for the most part, that's, that the projects that are going up are pretty modest comparatively. We don't, we do not have huge growth. The, the Sorry, you don't know what you're talking about if you believe that. The, <laughs> okay, the but the fact is is that the projects, all future and current projects, are all abiding by, um, as, as Doug explained, the requirements that uh, limit their contribution to um, increase stormwater drainage. I mean, the water is still the water; it's just how quickly that volume is processed in the system. When you make a non-permeable surface, it's processed much faster. A roof counts as a non-permeable surface. A, 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 parking lot, a driveway, a roadway that used to not be paved. And there are systems that are being encouraged now that are permeable, that uh, and, and you could take, you know, the community could take Terry's lead and tear up their asphalt as uh, Michael Kirby suggested to do. But that, yes, that's the point. Uh, the council is probably the best avenue for the conversation and that discussion. Um, when we had, uh, Barbara, I think you were next. Does the BPW have a an enterprise fund set up? No, no. Not, not for this. It, it okay. may be an interesting idea, but there's nothing like that now. So if you want to put money aside, you, it's still going to be in the general fund. You'd have to talk to Ned about the, the particulars the of that. I believe once it's been appropriated, it's sequestered and set aside for a fund. Okay, so now how are you going to get this extra money? <laughs> That's what we you need to know. And are, are there going to be different fees? And I just heard about Williamsburg. Um, their their um, sewage going down into us. They do pay for that. There are one of our larger customers. Okay, so how many other customers do you have going into yeah. the city? Well, actually, only Williamsburg. Okay. I, I think Coke is actually our largest customer. Well. That's in the city I'm talking if, about. If I may, actually, to that very question about how are we going to pay for this, mm -hmm. we're going to reserve the next meeting for that whole conversation, that, to expand that conversation, because this can't be done in the, the less than an hour that we have available. I mean, this is, I mean, and this is the setup. These guys are setting up the table. They're making the presentation mm -hmm. to explain what the challenges are. And then, then we have an opportunity through a series of meetings to figure out how we're going to and address those problems. What is the city budget? What is the city budget? The for annual budget. The annual budget, well, let's see. Uh, 87 80 million? 80 million. It was, 80 million? It was $76 million, uh, the last one that was approved. It's about 80 million. Yeah. So, so we're 
talking about 2% from the end. Yeah. 2% of that budget in addition, yeah, in additional to what? Actually, a little bit less because that's 400,000, 1.2, 1.6, 1. 1.4. Well, as, as Terry laid it out, of course, the projected was over the uh, coming years about 1.4, 1.5. Uh, Mary Sorrett, it's Paul Spector. Yeah, I have one more kind of uh, technical question. I know that the DPW was doing a study a couple of years back looking at nitrogen outflows from uh, some of the biggest uh, producers of wastewater in the city, uh, looking at the Coke plant, looking at the Gazette, looking at Cooley Dickinson Hospital. And I know that uh, a while ago, too, there was a problem over at the Coke plant with their, their pretreatment, and, and that, that the effluent coming from the Coke plant was very high in, in stuff that would produce nitrogen-rich outflow. And I'm wondering what's the status of that? Like, is the Coke plant back in compliance? And, and uh, is there any way we can reduce nitrogen by by um, cracking down on, on some of the bigger producers of um, nutrient-rich outflows in the city? Then you want to field that one, or Doug? Sure. Uh, Coca-Cola is actually uh, doing an expansion of their existing pre-treatment plant right now. <laughs> the eyeballs there. Uh, we expect that completion to be done in about a year. Uh, they built a treatment plant to deal with uh, BOD waste coming off the chilled juice line. A counterpart of that was high uh, total suspended solids. Mm -hmm. They can't balance both of them. They came to the city, asked if we would do an expansion of our wastewater facility to help them. We said no. You need to pre-treat your waste in conformance with your permit. So we've been meeting with them over the past year and they're actually working with their engineers right now. And hopefully by, I believe it is November next year, the additional capacity of the pre-treatment plan will be done. So that, I'm just, I'm just wondering about ways to cut down on nitrogen. We're doing this 10% total reduction in nitrogen citywide. Um, and we're, you know, and I know you guys are working with the wastewater treatment plant, but again, my question is, uh, what about the biggest contributors to nitrogen rich outflow? in the city, I mean, we're talking about coke. I, I know you've been tweaking the plant, but what really are the prospects for getting the biggest contributors to that problem in the city to maybe do their part? Well, that's it, that's through the pre-treatment program, so right? So Coca-Cola, what about the other? Uh, the there's, other I think there's a dozen pre-treatment permits that are out there, but most of it is just sampling. I don't know of any other facility in the city that actually has a pre-treatment, a treatment plant operating on their site. Well, we've done some modifications in our plant, which increased aeration and changing the zones on the aeration basins. And we actually did this study uh, two summers ago to reduce our, our nitrogen quite a bit to the Connecticut River. The big question is, is it going to be in that 10% that we were talking about earlier? That's why I don't know there. Uh, yeah, I think this ties somewhat into Mary's question, because these yeah. are ways, how are we going to prevent certain things from happening and about you raise up um, rain, rain gardens. Are there ways, are there other ways that you guys have looked at or studies that could be done of what can we do that aren't just about systems but to prevent whether it's nitrogen, to prevent runoff or things like that and do we all get gravel gardens but are there other things you mentioned earlier it's just it's passing in such a way that maybe homeowners can take part in. But that's another thing to look at and would it make any kind of significant difference if we started instituting even a voluntary program in some way help residents to do what you call rain gardens or other or business owners to do that? Would it make any significant dif difference in the, in the storm water and the, uh, those issues? Who wants to take that on and Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
big contributor. Um, animal waste, farming. Um, I, I believe Ned said earlier that that 10% includes everything that goes out through the plant, but also through stormwater. So everything that doesn't go through the plant goes into the stormwater system or just runs off directly into the river. Do we have some sense of what, what that breakdown is? The question is uh, delving further into the issue of how we could possibly reduce the amount of nitrogen that reaches the river by 10% in total. I believe, from what I've been told, that most of the reduction is going to have to occur at the sewer treatment. Anything we can pick up on the stormwater side will be a, a bonus. We, we may need that bonus to reach a full 10% reduction, but the heavy lifting will occur on the sewer side. Uh, I'm guessing, um, I'd like information about rain gardens for private homes, and I'm guessing even if we go on the internet and find out about how to build one, maybe the location on our properties and things would make a difference and everything. Could you get something up on the DPW website about that for us? First thing, the, the question was, um, where can you get information for the rain gardens for the extension? Can we put it on the DPW website? We, we have some up there. Um, I think it's still there. Some of the links may have gotten old. I'll check on that, but I'll make sure that um, and we did, a few years back, we did a workshop Just a suggestion, you might think about a tax credit for people who build rain gardens. Uh, does a dry well count for a rain garden? <laughs> I think I saw a figure that, that Smith College and maybe other nonprofits constitute about 25% of the impervious area of the city. I'm just making this up. Go <laughs> <laughs> ahead. <laughs> okay. okay, 35%. Okay, is there anything that's being can be done in terms of having? non-tax paying people assessed a certain amount per their impervious area? At, at the moment, as I've explained, all of this money comes from the general fund. And the colleges, the churches, the nonprofits in the city do not contribute any money toward that fund. That's, as you look at the pros and cons between using general funds or having some kind of a fee, that is one of the advantages. Yeah. Just like they pay a water bill, just like they pay a sewer bill. Right. But at the moment, as we're paying for it in this manner, they're exempt from any of your contributions. Any other questions? Oh, just a brief thought. My name is Lee. We have a, about an $80 million, uh, or we get $40 million or $44 million coming from real estate property taxes. If we get a two percent for the quarter or two and a half percent increase in that, it's not that substantial increase. It's a pretty small amount of money that has to be distributed amongst everybody in every aspect of the city. So to think that we could actually take all of the money in our increase in our tax, our two and a half percent, and put it towards this is pretty it's not going to happen. We know that's what the private will be telling us. Um, but uh, and Marianne Lavarge also did a sit on the finance committee we made along with Councilman White. And we know just exactly how tight it is. So we have, uh, like uh, Terry said, we have another meeting that we're going to have that is going to come up. We're going to brainstorm again on just exactly how to pay for this stuff. We don't even know. We don't have a clue for how to pay for it. But somewhere along the line, we've got to, we've got to do something. And um, I don't know. Uh, uh, we wrestle with money in the finance committee constantly, because there really is that. So it's not much.
much it's not a big wrestling match because there's no money. Um, so I, I just want everybody to leave here knowing that there's there's no magic wand here. Somehow or other we have to come to some way to pay for all this. My city council will have an idea, but we'll bring that up next week. I just have to do some math in the meantime. It's not my strong suit. Um, how many households do we have in North Canada? Twenty thousand. Twenty thousand. Twenty thousand. Yeah, more than that. About about one point five per per household. I want to say. Let me have my neck out. I'm going to say sixteen thousand four hundred. Okay, so about 8,000 people who are paying for water and sewer. That includes businesses, so you, yes. you'd have to think for residences, yes. something less than 8,000. Okay, but businesses pay for water and sewer. Although some people live, are on a well, but that's, that's the ballpark, I would think. It's interesting also that there are uh, communities in the eastern part of the state that um, that have asked their nonprofits to pay 10% of their assessed value to the property, pay 10%. And it actually came, I think in the city of Boston, it came to $4.9 million that their nonprofits volunteered to pay into uh, uh, their general fund. It's actually $4.9 or $4.7 million. Maybe, but they have to volunteer to pay it. There's no way to make them pay it. And, and Gene, just, uh, I know you're in the construction business, so I would just suggest that the city look to, instead of uh, having all these housing construction, that uh, Bill Dwight seems to be oblivious to, uh, there'd be uh, an effort made to look to bring the in-city uh, construction workers, uh, employ them, make a special effort to get them involved in these projects as they, as they go on, whatever it takes. Um, it looks like the meeting is sort of falling apart on its own. So I, I, the, the thing that I would like, I'm actually pleased, I, despite the low numbers, there are actually people who will be watching this on television this actually there will be a record of this and it will be uh, replayed on NCTV. Um, we are considering another meeting probably, what we, we say, a Soon. month's time? Yeah. Something like that, in a month's time to discuss the, you know, the really scary issue. Now we've been presented with the prospects, and now we're gonna talk about the scary issue or the grown-up issue, the ones that we have to face as adults and citizens of the community that we want the same, we cherish. So we're gonna have that conversation. And um, in the meantime, uh, I like the idea of the fact that people are volunteering consider their contribution to the stormwater system. And 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 the counselor, former counselor uh, Tomasco had mentioned, you know, developing some kind of a, a tax offset or rebate that were limited in many respects by the state law, but there might be something that we can, you know, ideas like that are great, where we can come up with maybe some way of compensating someone who's, who reduces their contribution to the stormwater <coughs> Those are the type of ideas that I think we, we, we have, we have uh, you know, I've always said that we're a city blessed with 29,000 geniuses, each one smarter than the next. And my hope is that, that pooling synergistically that group together, we're gonna come up with some good practical ways to approach this and also